This is the story of a neighborhood nestled in the nation's capital. A neighborhood that grew greats like Duke Ellington and Mary McLeod Bethune. A neighborhood that raged and mourned the loss of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. A neighborhood that survived. A refuge from Jim Crow, a foothold through gentrification, a beacon of hope in a pandemic. A neighborhood that flourished and inspired its own festival, cementing the future of music in DC. An irreplaceable community with voices that can't be muted. A neighborhood known as Black Broadway. Black Broadway, to me, it means legacy. You know, there's this famous quote that says this. It says, what you do is your history, but what you set in motion is your legacy. And Black Broadway is all about legacy. We feel like we're a part of the fabric of Black Broadway. Yeah. Um, we've always blended in um, ever since we started in the business, 1945. And, uh, you know, we've always just been a part of everything going on. The Black Broadway represents to me um, black excellence and black genius at a time when America was at its most racist period. It just became a hot pot of boom, love and creativity. Freedom and economic opportunity laid the foundation for the District of Columbia to become a mecca for Black people. Marked by the opening of Howard University on March 2nd, 1867. Geographically, Black Broadway consists of the U Street Corridor and the Shaw Cardozo LaJoy Park neighborhood. For many, these streets symbolize Black freedom and nurtured Black excellence. I think 1910, when, when the Black brought, when, when, the, when the Howard Theater opens, it sent a very clear message. This is an important place to hold a big theater. We're talking big, 1,200 seats. Ain't nothing like that ever happened in America, in a black community. So I think it was, that was the moment that people said, this is an important place to invest. However, I would even go back um, to the 1860s, 50s and 60s, when African Americans are fleeing slavery in the South, particularly North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, and they're coming into D.C. to be free, because D.C. is 90% free blacks at that time, and they see this as a place to get themselves a, a, a safe place to live. So I think, I think we really talk in the 1850s and 60s, and then by the time we get to the 1880s and 90s, Howard University is producing you know, the best and the brightest in black America. And that's when this place really took off as an economic engine and a place of opportunity. With greats such as Pearl Bailey, Cab Calloway, and Zora Neale Hurston, regularly seen on Black Broadway, as well as everyday black Americans, Black Broadway quickly became a place in which African-American culture and influence thrived. If you hear the word Broadway, you immediately think of what? New York. Well, it came directly from New York's theater district, which is known as Broadway. And some researchers have said, researchers have said that DC native Pearl Bailey is the one that coined this term Black Broadway. Now, Pearl Bailey, she is an artist, well-known, grew up in DC, and she also got her start at the Howard Theater. She was a part of the high-stepping group, the Howard Nets. She used to perform at the Howard Theater. And a lot of researchers are giving her the credit for actually saying Black Broadway for the first time. But that term comes from what we know as New York as the theater district of Broadway. Now why does that connect to DC? Well most people are familiar with the Harlem Renaissance but before there was a Harlem Renaissance there was a DC Renaissance and a lot of the people that we know of course Duke Ellington who was a jazz artist that went on to compose more than 6,000 works. He grew up on T Street. He got his start right here in Black Broadway. Now of course he played in Harlem. He did some shows there. We know uh, Pearl Bailey as well, whether it's Cab Calloway, Sarah Vaughn, all these other greats, Louis Armstrong that may have been born in New York and played in New York, they still came to U Street at some point to hone their talents and then took it to other places of the nation. So what you're going to see walking up and down the street are students from Howard University and professors. You're going to see churchgoers. You're going to see people coming out of church on a Wednesday night after a Bible study, out of church on a Friday night after choir practice. 
You're going to see them coming out of church on Saturday for their social events and certainly Sunday. So you're going to see, you're going to see professionals, doctors and lawyers. You're going to see everyday people. It was a place where black people could really express themselves freely, but also a place that they could show themselves off. It was a Broadway. You know, uh, we actually used to also call it the Black Champs Elysees. So on Sundays after church, you know, the ladies and the guys would get all dressed up for church. And then when church would leave out at two o'clock, they'd just walk down U Street and look good. It's a beautiful, cohesive, tight-knit neighborhood. And folk just enjoyed themselves, you know, had fun. Sunday, on every Sunday, it was like Easter parade out here. Women would be dressed up, men would be dressed up. You couldn't come on U Street unless you were dressed up. Uh, you know, you didn't, see, you didn't see like you see uh, back in, after that. Because they, people, people were shabby looking bad, you know what I mean, back in those days. But before that, you had, you had to be dressed up to come down to U Street. It was the, it was the Mecca. So Howard Theater is super important to Black Broadway because Black Broadway is known first for the artistry. It's known first for the entertainment and for the jazz. Although there's a lot of other aspects of Black Broadway, that's the flashy part of it, right? That's what gets your attention. And Howard Theater was the place that got people's attention. It was a place where there were athletes. I mean, Joe Lewis, there were boxers, there were comedians, there were all these different entertainers. There were singers, of course, that came to Howard Theater and not just um, black people came to watch these shows. No, white people came too. In fact, um, almost a quarter of the audience at Howard Theater would often be white people. And so that makes Howard Theater special because it was a place during segregation that black and white people could come together and have a good time, could be entertained, could watch a good show. I mean, even come to a theater and watch a circus. Howard Theater wasn't the only hotspot in the corridor. More than 300 Black-owned businesses, 100 churches, and other hubs for art and entertainment lined its streets. And all up and down uh, U Street, the Lincoln Theater used to be a, a dance hall underneath the Lincoln Theater in the basement called the Lincoln Colonnade. A lot of people didn't know about that. They had cabarets down there, Black folk, rich Black folk, you know, because Black folk had money back in those days, right? Still do, but I mean, more money uh, than, say, the average person. Uh, and so, yeah, they, they would party all of them. Have the Cas Bar, which is right next to where uh, Ben's Chili Bowl is, where Ben's next door is now. That was the Cas Bar. And they had all night dancing and partying and whatnot. So U Street was the Mecca. I mean, it's fantastic. Party, party central. While Black Broadway existed as a place of freedom during segregation and Jim Crow, the African Americans that made the corridor great were also committed to ensuring that Black liberation could be felt everywhere. U Street was an intellectual and political epicenter. So there was a huge intellectual aspect of uh, Black Broadway. Just the part of a DC Renaissance, a Renaissance in general, is this um, reinvention or it is um, kind of this revival, if you will, of culture and of inventions and innovations, but that also wasn't just with artistry and entertainment, but it was also when it came to education. It's when it came to being a scholar. And so this intellectual renaissance started with Howard University, which was founded in 1867 because of the Freedmen's Bureau. And Howard University drew all of these notable people to U Street, people that wanted to get an education but couldn't in the South. Women that wanted to get an education but couldn't elsewhere. A lot of people don't know that the first graduating class of Howard University not only was it not all black, but it also included women, which is major when you're talking about the 1800s. At this point, women can't even vote, but they're graduating from a university. That is so major. Another one that I want to mention is Mary Church Terrell, who she was also a teacher at M Street High School. And what makes her so special and another um, landmark, the Mary Church Terrell house is actually still located right here at LaDroit Park. But why is she so special is she was one of the founding members of the NAACP. And a lot of times when you hear about, the, you know, the March on Washington and this beginning of activism and the civil rights movement, a lot of times our black women get left out. But no, Mary Church Terrell was right here, one of those intellectual minds that she was just very smart. She was a, a top educator and she was one of the founding members of the NAACP, but she didn't stop there. She also founded the National Association for Colored Women. So you 
you have these great minds that aren't just doing the work of education, but they're taking what they're learning and now they're becoming activists. And so that's what made this renaissance, if you will, so special. Black-owned banks meant that African-American entrepreneurs in D.C. could access the resources and capital necessary to build Black Broadway into a place of both community and commerce. The eyes of the world are on the nation's capital. These are the interwar years and the war years. So you got World War I, World War II, and in between you've got, you've got peace and prosperity. And so you've got a very dynamic culture all over the city. And so thinking about that time in the political scene, it wasn't just about politics, it was also very financial, it was very economical. Um, specifically on U Street, it was a very diverse place, a lot of black owned businesses, but there were also businesses that weren't owned by black people. And a lot of times they had no problem, yeah, come in, you can shop, spend all your money, but we are not gonna hire you to work here. We're not gonna pay you, but give us your money. And that was something that disturbed a lot of black people on U Street. Of course it disturbed them. It's unfair and it's prejudice. Black Broadway was truly a mecca for African Americans in the United States. On U Street, Black culture, businesses, and activism flourished. It's this time period from the 1900s to about the mid-1900s where U Street was the core for commercial activity, for education, for innovation, for entertainment, for partying for black people. I mean, Jim Crow kept black people out from partying and owning their own businesses and owning their own property in other parts of the city. But on U Street, black people were free to be their own, they were free to own their own, and so that's exactly what they did. Yeah, well, I, 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 can only, I can't speak for my mom and dad. They both passed away, they're the ones that bought this building in 1968 and uh, we've always been on U Street but we weren't in this particular building and uh, but uh, uh, I believe that they saw that there was more visibility they were in the 900 block and in the middle of the block so there was a lot more visibility here on the corner and especially when with the Bohemian Caverns across the street and the Industrial Bank on the other side of the street you know they've always been there and so uh, that was that was their vision. They saw it, and the building went up for sale, and they jumped right on it. Despite Black Broadway's growing reputation as a place of freedom for D.C.'s Black residents, the struggle for civil rights could still be seen and felt along the corridor. On April 4th, 1968, 879 miles away in Memphis, Tennessee, a single bullet changed everything. So the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was a shock to the world. It was a shock to the nation and it was definitely a shock to U Street. Martin Luther King had played such a pivotal role on U Street. Um, he teamed up with U Streeters from the Black Broadway era just to have the March on Washington. The planning for that was right here on U Street. His office for the um, SCLC was on U Street. And so there was a, a shock. I mean, just thinking about some of the community members that lived through the time of his assassination in 1968, which of course spiraled the, that same day, the, the day it was announced, these riots that went on for several days because the city itself was literally hurt. Now we, now we have two actual dynamics occurring in the mid to late 60s at the same time. First, the 64-65 Civil Rights Acts uh, really began to loosen up the suburbs where African Americans who had the wherewithal, who were professionals and had the money and had the wealth would leave the city and go out to the suburbs to find places to live. Often, however, poorer people would stay here and could not move. And consequently, when Dr. King was killed, who was well known as the Prince of Peace, people could not take it anymore. Their anger, their disappointment, their frustration exploded and they rebelled, and the uprising was severe. And up and down the street, half of this block, half of this strip, the Black Broadway was burned out. So if you walk down U Street today, wherever you see a new building, that means those buildings were burned out in the 68 Rebellion. Now let, let me say a word about that, however. I'm not using the word riot, 
Because I don't believe that people rioted and burned their black businesses down. What I think people did is they rebelled against the killing of Dr. King and they attacked those businesses that would not hire African Americans. Black people don't burn their businesses down. So I actually consider this not a riot, but a rebellion, an uprising. After years and years of segregation, after years of, of distrust, after years of police brutality, after years of poor housing and poor opportunities, people said enough was enough. It was pretty violent and it was pretty, uh, it was very ugly. Unfortunately, uh, um, U Street uh, began to uh, um, lose its luster thereafter. The assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the violence that followed were a devastating blow to the Black Broadway neighborhood. Despite what seemed like the decline or even end of Black Broadway, U Street survived. It was slow. It was slow, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't immediate. Um, the whole, this whole city took a while to recover. You know, just something like that, like people's businesses burned down, and, you know, uh, all along H Street, 7th Street, Georgia Avenue, U Street, 14th Street. All of these streets had burned out businesses, you know what I mean? So uh... during the 70s, there was a lot of rebuilding. But unfortunately, unfortunately, later on, as the black middle class left, crack cocaine started coming in and drugs started coming in and desperation came in. And then we entered a long period. And a part of that period was the Reagan philosophy of moving money out of the ur urban centers and in, in in, in, in American cities and moving it into defense spending to counter the Soviet Union. And that's when we began to really see the collapse of urban centers. Yeah, so some factors and some institutions that helped with recovery and rebuilding Howard University, of course, education, just because there are riots, just because things were shut down, it doesn't mean that Howard University shut down. There were also all these other groups. There were different places on U Street. It was um, the Washington chapter of SNCC was located right there on U Street. Actually, the beginning of the riots, uh, Stokely Carmichael was the one that came to the city and kind of rounded up the troops. And so there was still this, there were still people there on U Street that could get the culture back up and running, but it didn't look pretty. It was a hard and long process, and there were different institutions, there were different organizations that played a big part in that, and also there were different aspects that came into rebuilding the city itself. Businesses such as Lee's Flower and Card Shop and others remained a part of the community and advocated for safety and equality in the neighborhood. All of this occurred just as a new cultural expression was being birthed in the district. Go-Go. Go-Go and Funk emerged during the really rough years of the end of the 70s, 80s, and 90s, when urban centers really began to collapse, mostly as a result of Reaganomics, shifting resources from the cities to military spending. Crack cocaine devastates the neighborhoods. Violence, police brutality, all of this is just a horrible period in American history, particularly in urban centers. Along with this new, homegrown sound, the 80s and 90s marked the start of a new era for Black Broadway. So during the 70s, 80s, up to the 90s, Washington, D.C. as a whole, and specifically on U Street, it was known as Chocolate City. Now, why was it known as Chocolate City? Because according to the 1970 census, Black people made up 70% of Washington, D.C.'s population. And so everywhere you went, you saw people of color, you saw Black people. And that came with the culture of Black people, that came with the history of Black people, that came with the music and the sound of Black people. In fact, Chocolate City got its name as a reference from the Parliament and Funk Band referring to Chocolate City. And that was a reference directly to D.C. It was about these cities where there's predominantly Black people, about these cities where there is music. And then of course, you know go-go music is founded and begins around this time and so it's really this place where there's this overwhelming spirit and pride if you will for african americans so u street survives a second time one because u street always survives that's what history has taught us about the u street corridor which is what makes it so powerful
powerful and special. But Ustri survives again, and I'm just gonna give you one name and two words, Marion Berry. Oh, Marion Berry's influences everywhere. I mean, it's, it's incredible how people forget that throughout Southeast, Northeast, um, North, the whole area, even into Maryland, his influence reached because nobody was doing anything positive. Everybody was dipping in, dabbling, hustling, selling weed, and then when crack came, it was like a boom, just like a nuclear bomb went off and everybody was trying to figure out what to do. But fortunately, he was smart enough to learn how to get the men coming home from jail, how to get the up and coming teenagers into programs. Like I was saved because it's some youth program. So I wouldn't be here today without it. And then to see what he did in the U Street corridor and like Georgetown, even up Georgia Avenue by bringing in new businesses and telling people, hey, start your own business. Let's see what you do. Let's see what you get out of the grandma's kitchen with your recipes. Start the restaurant, start the curry out. And then you have folks doing the uh, clubs. And for a while, there was plenty of places to go and you know enjoy some black entertainment fresh off the street. You have the street performers that perform by the subways during the day or the bus stops downtown. And then they shift into the nightclubs at night. Business owners weren't the only ones embracing Black Broadway's revival. Black artists and creatives in the district were returning to U Street as well. As businesses and culture began to boom again, DC also began to attract some new neighbors. The jubilant, often public displays of go-go music sounded like home for native Washingtonians, but DC's newest neighbors weren't as receptive. In the spring of 2019, decades of tension between advocates of DC culture and music and new residents finally came to a head. A friend of mine, Don, Donald Campbell, owned a store on a 7th from Florida Avenue in Shaw, and Gentrifiers came in and tried to silence uh, the store, but we feel like people have been trying to silence us in many ways, silence businesses, silence uh, African Americans living here, silence us for being uh, who we are in a culture that made this city what it is, when nobody wanted to be here. So we're saying that you can't mute what was here before you came, you know, and we're, we're fighting to uplift the city and keep it great for everybody because we're going to be truthful. A lot of people who came to this city, black or white, came here because of the culture and the diversity that was here. So we don't protect that. DC won't be the same. The hashtag Don't Mute DC, uh, it absolutely is now a politicized movement that started with trying to save Donald Campbell's store on 7th in Florida. Um, I think that what it represents is just, again, people trying to protect the legacy of this city. Uh, in music, music is always centered around culture somewhere, right? Like when Prince came out, they had culture there with that pop sound, you know, mixing rock with, with pop. And then you had uh, in New York, hip hop. That was a cultural thing. And in Atlanta, you got trap. That's a culture thing. In the West Coast, they had their own thing. DC has had our own thing. We don't have to go anywhere. Uh, DC has the most intense gentrification in America, and black people have been, have bared the brunt of that. And so with that, uh, our culture, our norms, things that we enjoy uh, have been uh, ridiculed and attacked. And so whether it's Don't Mute DC or the DC Phone Parade, um, those th the things that we do, we have to protect them. And there's been a necessity for people to stand up and say to, uh, you know, just people moving here that we, you have to respect us. Uh, we meet you halfway, but you also have to, you know, you can't eradicate everything that we do. One of the new additions that we did make to Funk Parade uh, was to include a, a short conference, um, which close into the planning process, we decided to kind of pay homage to the Don't Meet DC movement um, with Ronald Moten and Tone P and all of these individuals. We realized, hey, we've got a space and we've got a place to bring city officials in, cultural icons, musicians, artists, activists, entrepreneurs, bring them together to actually talk on this platform about what our plan is, you know, to move forward and to continue. Despite gentrification, tensions between native Washingtonians and newcomers, and the challenges facing artists in the district, much of Black Broadway's legacy can still be seen and felt on every block. In addition to the buildings, Black Broadway's history also lives on through initiatives such as the Funk Parade. But really what the Funk Parade is, is taking an important part of the city, that the city government at the time was not showing interest in preserving, you know, the history and the music and dedicating it as a, as a you know, historical music uh, neighborhood. Um, 
So when we started talking about doing an event on Funk Parade, there's a long history of events, parades that happened on, on in the U Street neighborhood. Everything from uh, the Caribbean Festival on Georgia Avenue to every single time Ben's Chili Bowl used to shut down the street, but a lot of those were disappearing and there weren't more events coming in its place. And we figured out through a long process that actually the city was making it hard to shut down that street. Um, but when we, when we came up with the event, we realized that we are two white guys <laughs> talking about doing a festival on U Street. So um, immediately we turned to the community. We turned to the cultural nonprofits, the, the, the music collectives, the historic businesses that have been there, uh, the nonprofits that are there, the community associations. And we had our first meeting to say, hey, this is the idea. This is what we're thinking about a structure for the event, having a day fair part, having a parade, and then having this music festival because they're the most, U Street is also the neighborhood that has the most number, historically has had the most number of music venues in the city and currently still has the most number of places to see music within DC. So we knew that the venues were there, the venues were excited. And so we just brought everyone together. If I had to pull out four staples from Funk Parade, um, for me personally, um, at the end of the day, you know, I used to ask myself, okay, what am I, what am I managing? What am I keeping together here? Um, and outside of the project, to me, it boils down to community, art, live music, and freedom. We have to keep the community involved and have them involved. That's why the day festival uh, portion of Funk Parade will always be free. It will always be an opportunity for all of us to come together and celebrate whether you're an individual that was tapped to actually be in the parade or whether you were a musician who called an open street corner and decided to set up and share your art with the community that way because the space was open and available. Since its start in 2013, Funk Parade is an inclusive cultural event featuring art, performance, and reflection on the state of the District of Columbia and its communities. The parade is held every spring on the U Street Corridor and is led by multidisciplinary artist and entrepreneur David the O. Oliver. Around 2015, I was at a farmer's market that a friend of mine was doing in the Southwest, and they all kept saying, oh yeah, we're gonna go to U Street, we're gonna go to U Street. I'm like, yeah, we go to U Street all the time, what's so special? Well, we're going to the Funk Parade. I said, Funk Parade? Huh, what? How y'all gonna have something about funk and I not know about it? Y'all know I do funk music. So I go there and I saw the setup and I said, wow, this is great. I mean, the alleyways, like the old days with the breakers and skateboarders going here. I mean, from the municipal center on 14th and U, I'm dancing with uh, the groove people over there and we partying with the drummers and everything. I'm flipping, I'm doing the splits. And I'm like, oh man, this is live, this is hitting. And then to come down to Bohemian Cabins, everybody's hanging out the windows getting ready. And I didn't know that it was no barriers to the parade. That was the first thing that brought me in. I was like, there's no barriers? They said, no, we all just stand right here and enjoy it, man, and watch what's go down. And uh, I just stayed on top of it. I kept waiting for them to post when they needed volunteers. And I said, the only thing I'm gonna do is I'm a volunteer what I do professionally, I'm a host. I go out for hosting auditions for game shows and TV shows, so why not do the same here? Bring it back home. They brought me to the meeting and I first met Chris, who created it, and the rest of the team. And again, they had no idea who I was. But in that meeting at Ben's Chili Bowl, they got a lot out of me and saw what I can bring as far as structuring. And in that conversation, I was like, so, so who gets y'all on TV? Nobody. Justin and I are too ugly to get on TV. I said, okay. So I said, so who's gonna be the representative for when you guys get out there? He said, you will. Not only does Funk Parade honor and celebrate DC's musical and cultural history, the festival also shapes the future of Black Broadway through its commitment to music education for youth in the area. Black Broadway's legacy is a blueprint for forming a culturally rich community, supporting artists, and navigating change. So the relationship between Funk Parade and Black Broadway, well, that's the biggest connection that you can make because it's the Funk Parade. Chocolate City, DC, U Street got their name from a funk band. And so the connection is so direct. DC Funk and DC Funk Parade is really a celebration of that talent and it's really a place uh, for community and it's a good feeling um, to just see artists come together and just celebrate that, that camaraderie and that love for music and I feel like that's what DC Funk really embodies. Funk is, you know, funk is a really important concept that uh, 
that, that shows the shows people that they really have an expressive uh, 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 communication going on with each other. And I think it's very wise that community leaders, uh, our elected officials, and the community itself is demanding that we continue our go-go and continue our funk. Um, I'm very impressed with what the Funk Parade is doing, the, the musicianship is doing, the Funk University. Um, we're a funky city and we don't want our culture, we don't want our soul to go away. So stuff like this has structure and that's the power and change that we need, more structure. And so, the spirit of Black Broadway lives on. It lives on through the brilliance nurtured at Howard University and Howard Theater. It lives on through the visionaries leading Lee's Flower and Card Shop, Industrial Bank, Ben's Chili Bowl, and other Black-owned businesses. It lives on through the community and cultural expression found in Funk Parade and the Don't Mute DC movement. Black Broadway lives on through the sounds, souls, and stories of the U Street Corridor. There's so much power that's just left on the table, you know? And I'm really hoping a lot of folks after this year and next year, when COVID restrictions are reduced, that they can come along and say, hey, 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 I see what's on that table, let me get a slice and take it. Because there's a lot of potential there. Once we touch on the history, the future will be taken care of. Yeah, I've seen a lot of, um, you, know, you know, black people opening up restaurants or clubs and um, things on U Street. I, I really feel like we're building that um, black businesses back up on U Street. So I really see that in the future. I see it becoming more on the black Broadway wave. Mm -hmm. I think the future of funk music in Washington, D.C. is bright, it's lively, but it is yet to be intentional. And that is the one main thing that I think in our adoption of the Funk Parade, that we want to ensure that we do well. Because at the Musicianship, uh, we were born as an organization of instrumental music, uh, more so specifically marching band and marching band culture. Uh, we were born on the campus of uh, our alma mater, Howard University, and so of course, that Showtime marching band culture, which uh, our co-founders, Diane Granger and Jeffrey Tribble were a part of, is really what you know, bore and got the organization started. What I think is very valuable about what you are doing and the musicianship and the funk parade is that you're training uh, young people and that you're getting them involved in the music, but not just the music, which are, every kid likes the music. They like the drums, they like the beats, they like the rhymes, they like the feats. But what you're doing is you're really educating them to about their history and their culture. This is what gives them soul. This is what gives them hope. This is what gives them creativity. So thank you, Musicianship, for doing what you're doing, training our young people. And they, in fact, it's cliche, but they, guess what? They are the future. <laughs> They're the future of funk. They're the future of go-go.